Once again, welcome to the Color Lab convention. Uh, this is our 40th convention. Uh, today's Monday, March the 25th. And our session is entitled Teaching Outside the Box. My name is Tom Money. I'll be the moderator. And I have two panelists here to my right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Betsy Gotta from New Jersey. <laughs> Betsy began calling in 1961, has experience with programs basic through challenge, is an accredited caller coach, received a Caller Lab's highest honor in 2006, the Milestone Award, and more recently, the Aussie Award for Best Overall Female Caller. <laughs> to her right is Bob Elling from California, <laughs> Bob began calling in 1972. He has experience also with programs from Basic through Challenge. Has conducted a number of caller seminars. Uh, is a recording artist on Riverboat, Square Tunes, and ESP. Has been active in a number of caller associations in his state, and has taught square dancing in the public schools. So we welcome his insight also. Thank you, Bob. This is uh, a recorded session, so we do need to use the microphone at all times. If there are questions, we do need to uh, use the mic, and I'll bring it around. So I would like to start uh, with just a little overview. Some of the things we're going to explore today have to do with unique ideas and concepts on teaching people how to dance, new teaching tips, uh, some significance of what the teaching order entails, and also things uh, such as using formations other than squares when you're teaching students. So we'll begin with Betsy. Okay. Well, it works. I just want to know where it's plugged in. Okay, now I sound like me. Okay. The panel is called Teaching Outside the Box. And I have different, different, I, two different things, uh, uh, two different aspects that I want to focus on. One is using formations other than squares, and different, and the other, and different descriptions of calls to bring the definitions to life for the dancers. If you teach everything in the same way, we all know, or at least I believe we've all been told more than once at Caller Lab that there are different learning styles. And if we continue to teach the same thing in the same way and it hasn't connected with whoever we are attempting to teach, then we need to change what we're saying. We don't need to say it louder and slower. You laugh, but I've seen it done. Um, and if you teach it the same way that you've always done, what happens is we teach in the style that we learn best in. That's poor grammar, but you understand what I said. And so... If I learn by listening, I'm going to teach by talking so that you can hear me. And then anybody who's a visual learner, anybody who is more kinetic, is going to be less able to follow my descriptions. So we need to have different ways of teaching the same call. When you consider how to... Uh, and and. If you change the way you say it, just one, one or two words, maybe the spark that connects. And that's a very important factor. When you consider how to teach calls, it's useful to know or note what errors dancers have made following the call definitions and examples when you previously taught or when you watched people taught, be taught or whatever. You need to kind of have a, an idea of where the pitfalls are. Because if you know where the pitfalls are, you are going to be able to perhaps head off some of the problems. The call square through, we all know, has built-in problems because of the fact that at some point the people on the right are going to use their left hand to walk by and have to turn 
uh, right, uh, or the people on one side are going to have to use their left hand to turn and walk by and turn right, and the people on the other side are going to have to use their right hand and walk by and turn left. That is contrary to good dancing flow. It is contrary to what we want to do. Therefore, people turn the wrong way. And we can lecture them about which way you turn all we want. But our bo their bodies are telling them, if I use the right hand, I want to go in that direction. And if I use the left hand, I want to go in that direction. And the fact that I want to have to use the left hand and go that way is contrary to what I physically want to do. If we know that, we can start doing something in a different way to perhaps offset the pitfalls. One of the things that I do is um, I developed this a while ago. Is I teach square through what I consider backwards. I believe that most of the callers in the world teach square through four hands and then say, and it can be fractionalized. But what about if you build it up? If you start with a square through one hand, which admittedly has limited choreographic value, but if you start with a square through one hand, you can teach, you give the hand, you walk by, and because you are not continuing, you no longer, you don't want to turn anywhere. And the, one of the most important things to me about teaching a square through is to let the dancers know that after the last hand, they are done. They don't turn. They don't pass go. There's no $200. They're bumper to bumper with the last person they touched. And if they're comfortable with that, you can have them back up and check for a bumper. But that becomes an important thing, thing for them to know because once they get going and, and have learned the turns, it's Newton's law of motion. They keep on wanting to turn some more. So square through one hand. Admittedly, I'd probably spend only one tip on that because it really isn't a big thrill. So I'll go then go for two hands. Now, on square through two, that's where the person in the lady's spot on the right-hand side uh, is giving a right hand and has to turn left. Same principle as in right and left through. They're giving a right hand and they have to turn towards their partner for the courtesy turn. And that's why you see ladies wandering out into right field because they've hung on a little long and their body uh, momentum carries them in the wrong direction. So if you catch that early, you give a right hand, walk by, let go, and then turn. Let go is an important concept. How many dancers have you seen who finish with what I call the pretzel arm, where the arm is back behind them? It's not even the pretzel hand. It's like, my arm's back here. And, that, of course, that's going to pull you right out of where you need to go in certain instances. So, we get, And I will practice and dance square through two hands for quite a while. It may be the rest of the night. If they're really getting that, then I'll add the third hand. Recently at our home club, I taught square through one hand, two hands, got to three hands right before the end of the dance because we keep people, what we do, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but what we do is we fold the class members into the club dances, and I'll talk about that in a little bit so we can keep working with them kind of throughout the dance. I got to three hands, and then that was the end of the dance. So the next time, I told my friend Dan, who was calling the next dance at the club, you need to teach square through four because they've had one, two, and three. Review that and go for four because they're right there. But they had all that time to assimilate the one, two, and three. If you teach all four hands, they have all these pitfalls. They're going to fail. And one of our famous uh, members who was a, a teacher from California, Jack Murtha, said, Pra forget practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if they practice it wrong, they will do it wrong for the rest of their square dance career, more than likely. So if you let them practice it wrong, it's going to continue to be a problem. And they may get embarrassed and they may fade away because you're always going, now, Tom, I told you you need to turn the other way. I really, you know, I want to help you, Tom. But Tom is now mortified or perhaps a little embarrassed. But either way, it's not comfortable. But I've always kept it that way. Yeah, I know. I understand that. Change. Yes. <laughs> and that's it. He's always done it that way. He doesn't want to change. You call, call pass-through from a static square has the uh, – heads pass through. 
They're facing out. Are they comfortable? No. They want to turn around. And it, it's a built-in problem. One of the ways I like to teach pass-through is if I, can, if I have a big enough group, I can get them up in a, couple, a circle of couples facing couples around the ring. Uh, contra dance leaders call it a Sicilian circle. It's a circle of couples facing couples. When you pass through, you go on and meet a new couple. There's no temptation to turn around if there's somebody else coming at you. Oh, good, I've done it right. There's somebody here. I must be safe. And once you've done it there in the big circle formation, you can translate it back into a square, and they've already had positive practice with pass-through and not turning around so that they can get the concept here in the square without panic. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Another call I teach from a circle, and it does not have to be a big circle, is the call star through. This sounds very weird, but it works. I think it's, I've read 10% uh, of American adults can't tell left from right easily. And one of the things that I try and do in teaching is always eliminate the embarrassment of possibly choosing the wrong hand. So if I... I'm going to do a, a demonstration here, so I'll switch mics. Yep. All right. So Tom and I are standing up, and we're going to make part of a square. You, would you be my corner? So we're circling left, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. I have you, uh, dancers turn and face their corner. Point towards the center of the circle. Notice I didn't say left or right. Bring those arms around to touch palms. Smile at each other. It's a little arch. Walk forward, take each other's spot, lady going under the arch, the man going around. There were no fractions. There was no left or right, and it seems to work. And that's an exaggeration. When I have them point, you know, if I'm really scared, I have them point towards the center of the circle before I have them touch hands. Because even if I say, we're going back, even if I say, face your corner and touch the inside hands, hands towards the center of the circle, somebody may reach with the wrong hand. But if I have them po all point towards the center of the circle, they're going to figure out that that's where they need to be and that's the hand they need to use. It was something I discovered. And I think it's because in, from a square set, when you're circling, there's a little more room than from facing couples. You have the ability to walk underneath the hand and turn and be comfortable and get to the point. And it will translate back to facing couples with less problem for the dancers. That's what I have discovered. I think it was born out of desperation. So... Eliminating the terms of uh, hands of left and right whenever possible so that I can help dancers to learn. If I eliminate that barrier, I eliminate that anxiety, they're better able to focus on what I'm actually saying. About most of the time, if I want dancers to use one hand or the other, I have them shake hands. I have ver met very few people in this society from age about five to age however, you know, to full adulthood and beyond, uh, who don't reach with the right hand and shake hands automatically. If you tell them, okay, face, face the person across from you, shake hands with them. Everyone will reach with the right hand without thinking about it. If I want them to do something with the left hand, I go, okay, now we've got your right hand identified. Raise the other one. That's the one I want you to use. And it sounds dumb, but it works because I've eliminated, oh my gosh, I chose the wrong hand. I'm so embarrassed. And by the time they're busy, they're done being embarrassed about the fact they picked the wrong hand, they've lost all the words I was teaching about the call I was teaching. So if you can use shake hands, I use shake hands for um, grand right and left to start a grand right and left. I use shake hands even before I teach Alaman Alaman left, I have them shake hands and use the other ones. I uh, right hand stars and, and square through all start with shake hands. And then you, can, then you can get on to something else. A descriptive picture to teach the call. Now in New Jersey, and I know off the interstates, we have exit ramps. 
You're going down the divided highway of the interstate, and you want to go get off the highway and make a left turn. Do you turn left across the median barrier? Mm-mm. You go to the right and you loop around, and that's your cloverleaf exit. And that's the action of the call, cloverleaf. Although what happens is some of the folks in a cloverleaf in a square are driving in, in England, and they're driving on the left, so they're getting off the other way. When I had a college club, I, had the, I, had, I distinctly had them riding down the highway on their motorcycle, their Harley Davidson. Why? Because one of the pitfalls of cloverleaf is when you do it one behind the other, with the dancers one behind the other. Where do the trailing dancers go? Where? They cut in front of the other one? Sometimes they come up next to the other one. So now envision the motorcycle. You're driving down the road on your Harley. Bob is my driver. I'm behind him. Okay, Bob's going to take the exit ramp. Do I, as the passenger, climb over his shoulders and wrestle the handlebars away from him to get in front? No, because we'd be in deep trouble. I have been known to say road pizza, which is not a pretty sight. But, and I said, and there's no sidecar. So if you come up next to them, you have to remember what you're doing now is hanging on to their waist with your legs flapping in the breeze. So stay behind your driver. And it's a joke, but it, it makes people, it paints a picture that people can understand. And now if you're with an older crowd, uh, you might, might use a moped instead of the Harley. They might not quite relate to the Harley. I remember uh, another woman who was teaching Walk and Dodge, uh, Laurel Eddie Mosley, and her, she's from down south here, and she liked to paint a picture about Walk and Dodge. And what she used to say was she was coming along with the groceries for her family, and her husband opened the, opened the door, and that was she was walking and he was dodging, and that was, it was a, a Dodge van. It was a Dodge van, right. <laughs> Exactly, Bob. What I the, what I like in walk and dodge or walk and dodge too is sometimes the automatic doors. You know, okay, you're the automatic door. The other the other one I use automatic door for like uh, elevator doors is separate around one, come into the middle. The people who are being split, they open, they close. It's the automatic door, and you don't even have to push a button. So if you can paint a picture that the dancers can relate to, that will capture those learners. That picture for somebody else is going, huh? But that's the beauty of it. So these are examples that I personally have found. You know, I analyzed calls to find where the pitfalls were, and then I said, let me figure out how to try and solve the problem before it happens. They're not, excuse me, they're not perfect, but they may help. If you can think of others, that's really great. Okay. Now, I'm going to also talk about what I touched upon, uh, teaching outside the box. We have talked about in Caller Lab and around the internet and all over whenever callers meet about different ways to bring people into dancing, you know, quick, quicker, more, more conveniently, however you want to say it. And our home club used to be on the Rutgers University campus, which is a state college in New Jersey. And we used to be college students. Uh, they used to be college students. And I could teach from zero to mainstream with a lot of DVD in 12 weeks. Can't do that now because we're off campus. And we evolved into a family club. So we might at a dance have members or friends ranging in age from 10 to 92. Because I mentioned my friend Dan who co-calls with me. His dad still comes out, and Bernie's 92. So we have all ages, all sizes. And we were slowly diminishing. We made adaptations. When we left campus, we changed the night we danced. Why? Because when we were on campus, we danced Thursday nights, first and third or second or fourth, I forget which, because Friday and Saturday were date nights, and Sunday was when you did your homework because you'd neglected it all weekend. And when we left campus and people were uh, having careers and they were starting to have families, they can't come out on a Thursday night. We wanted to keep the ones we had, so we went to first and third Sunday afternoons from two from 2.30 to 5. You can bring your kids. They can play in the corner. 
If you don't have kids, that's fine, but you'll still get home in time to get dinner and, and get to bed at a decent hour if you have to get up at 5 in the morning to go to your job. So we had, that was our first adaptation. That has nothing to do with teaching. It just means we were willing and able to adapt. And we coasted along for a while and tried a couple lessons and didn't have a lot of success and we slowly were diminishing and we looked around and said, you know, we're in deep trouble. We need to do something. We need to have lessons. Dan at that point had a wife, a daughter, a full-time job, was calling and was working on a second master's degree. I had a husband, no kids, full-time full -time job, I think, still, and was calling about five, night, five or six nights a week. Neither of us had a night to do lessons, is my point. So we came up out of sheer desperation with the plan that has worked for us. We do lessons an hour before the dance. So from 1.30 to 2.30 are lessons. That's about three tips worth of teaching, folks. Uh, and one of them is a lot of review. So we can't teach a lot. But then every other tip is wherever the class is from day one. So if I've taught them first lesson, circle left, circle right, swing, promenade, pass through, and right hand and left hand stars, and maybe grand right and left, that's what we call every other tip at. The other tips are full mainstream. Or sometimes if the class is behind, they're not quite full mainstream. We know what we haven't taught yet and we'll workshop it in. But it had to, it required us and the dancers to be flexible. It required the dancers to want to cooperate because one of the worst things that you can have is if you have every other tip for the class members to have all the club members going, I'll watch, arms folded, maybe a smile, but more likely not. No, we managed to persuade our folks at the club to buy into this. One of the terms we use is not this is for class. It's for either for class or club, or if you remember the old roller skating term, it's an all skate, everybody up. And that way we don't sing, single out the class members. We kind of, this is for everybody. And we have had good luck with managing to get people to not stick to the newbie squares and the experienced squares. You know, sometimes it's a word, matter of going, Tom, you know, there, there's a couple over there that need a lot of help. Would you and your partner make sure you dance with them? Next tip. And the, they'll be happy to take them next tip. There's one couple that came in a little late this year to lessons. And several different couples have split them up because they, dan they can't help each other. But they're doing better if they each dance with a se separate partner. And now they're actually starting to feel like they're comfortable. So that's what we do. And it's a, a different thing. It might not work for everybody. Uh, what, one more thing. Oh, other ways in our area, some of the clubs that teach through PLUS have had the, as soon as the class members are approaching mainstream or mainstream, they open their dance nights and every other tip is mainstream so that they f start to fold their new dancers into the club. Because that transition, where you're graduated, now come over here and dance with us, that is an exceedingly scary thing. We need to fold them in. If you start bringing them out to the club nights, even before they've reached plus, be, by letting them dance where they, where they are, you may have success. Okay. Other than that, look for different ways to succeed. What works for us may not work for you, but there may be something that you'll get an idea and say, let's try this. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. Just a couple things um, that kind of piggybacks on what uh, Betsy was talking about. Uh, I had a comment one night from a dancer. It really drove a point home. Uh, uh, they were in a, a group of people that I was teaching. And uh, even though, uh, and she put it very plainly. I mean, it really drove the point in. She said, even though I observe what's going on, and I'm out here on the floor and I do it, she said, I don't really have it until I go home and read about it. Because, of course, she had one of the handbooks with the 
pictures and so forth in. And I thought, you know, how important it was to be sure you cover all the bases. You know, do demonstrate it so they can observe it. Have things that they can read with explanations in. Let them be involved, get the experience. Uh, and more uh, recently, of course, we have the ability to have things like DVDs and other things with visual components that, that help that piece of it as well as the auditory. So anything you can do along the way to reach all the modalities really helps the new dancer uh, learn the material. The other thing that I think one of the points that Betsy was driving home as she, uh, as she was talking about some of the different calls and how she approaches some of those is to have a plan in place. You can't just walk in there for the evening and not have a plan in place. Even if it involves changing your plan and being flexible, that's fine. But you've got to have some goal or something in place when you walk in that dance hall for the evening. So you need to have a plan in place. And I don't think it's, it's ever uh, um, inappropriate to, to point out to inactive dancers to be sure they understand not to change that direction that they're faced unless there's either an automatic counterpart action with the call or the caller specifically tells those dancers to change facing direction. I'm not sure you can drive that point home <laughs> too much. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to bring that up on a number of occasions so they understand that, that concept. We have a question. Well, uh, while we're running the microphone over there, one of the jokes I make about those dancers who are not moving or not changing faces, you're doing the hardest thing in square dancing. And you did it very well. I'm Debbie Taylor from Cleelum, Washington. I have a question and a comment. How many tips do you traditionally do when you do your dances with the class coming in at a regular dance? You know, like you said, you do one for the class, one full mainstream. Uh, with announcements, it probably works out to about six tips, which means we finish with something for everybody. Because after the three tips, after the three tips of class before the quote started the regular dance, we start the regular dance with mainstream. So it'd be mainstream class or everybody mainstream everybody mainstream announcements everybody we have to we have to be out of the building by a certain time so we cannot sneak over five minutes or anything so usually i would like to see it be be more tips but it turns out we have a long treasures break this time because we've grown and there's a big line <laughs> and the comment is when we first started teaching round dancing we had a clinic that we went to Wayne Wiley and if any of you have ever heard of him he told me teach as if you have a blind person and a deaf person on the floor and you will hit everybody's learning capabilities All right, uh, before we hear from Bob, any other questions on items that Betsy has covered so far? Okay, we're going to turn this over to Bob. Hi, everybody. Hi, now, because it was teaching outside the box, what I chose to try to do is tell you about things I do that I'm not aware that others do, Okay. One thing, it's always been eager to get everybody up and moving right away, right? But Bessie said, you don't want them to do something wrong first. So I go out in the middle of the floor and I say, square dancing is easy. And it just involves a couple of hand maneuvers and then we do patterns. And I, I like to pick a, a nice large gentleman. Sir, could I have you come up here for a second? And I'm going to show you something. But, right. You know, and I say, we're going to learn things. And when we're side by side, the boys hold the girl's hand. The boys palm up, the girls palm down. I get that, okay? I say, sometimes you're not say, facing the same direction. Whenever you stay facing that way. We 
cross palms, and we make a star, okay? Anytime you're next to somebody, you must be holding their hand, okay? So we're here. Then I say face each other, and then I teach pass through first right here. I say, when we say pass through, we mean just walk by each other, okay? Turn around. doesn't matter how he does it. Then I talk about hands, shake right hands. We're going to do what they call a pull by, but it's a misnomer. We pull a little bit and pass through. We drop the hands before we even get close to that person's shoulder. Turn around. Left hand, pull by, dropping the hands. This is before they ever do it once. They get to the, and then arm turns. We say, well, I'm going to do arm turns, and we show them what a forearm is. And I say, you're looking at a wall. Okay, walk around that person when you see the opposite wall, let go and pass through. Okay, and there when you get to doing things later, you don't have the mistakes of them trying to courtesy turn and all of that. But let's talk about the palm star. This is what I really love doing. Take your thumb and put it against your fourth finger. Wrap your fingers around my hand. That's the star, right? Sir, you're good and strong. Don't let go of my hand, please. Okay, hold on tight. No, 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 sir. Hold on tight. Can't be done. When you get that thumb there, you cannot have that grip. And you'll never have a lady come up and say, he hurt my hand. It was uncomfortable. Because it's very comfortable. But at the same time, we can counterbalance. What did you call that? Count. He called it counterdancing earlier today but you can have that pressure and go around each other without the other. Now, a little side thing I put in, hook the thumbs. This is one of the most dangerous moves in jiu-jitsu. <laughs> this is square dancing, not jiu-jitsu. Please do not ever hook the thumbs. Thank you for helping me out there. Sure. And it says, I do that before they make their circle. But I also say something. I say, now you've seen all there is to know about square dancing. Everything else is putting those into combinations and making patterns. Okay, that's one thing I want to say. I'm sorry, I, I'm going to be pressed for time, and I'm going to try to get as much stuff in as I can. A big part of my teaching program at all levels is circle left. I want you to go this to your club Circle left, and while I don't say anything, count. And when you get to 16, say the word stop. See how many of your dancers are back at home. Or you'll see in some floors, at about 9 or 10, they start to go slower. Okay? It's 16 beats to get around. How many of you would drive a car without putting oil in it ever or tuning it up? Not a good idea, is it? I consider circle left and promenades as tune-ups for the square. Crazy, huh? Well, that's why they call me Crazy Bob. What happens is when you circle left, a little miracle happens to the set. They began to match the size of their stride. And when their stride is equal, we start doing the fancy patterns and they mesh well. Do you understand what I'm saying? It fits. It's otherwise we got a box with a whoop, big long line, you know, you got six, and he takes gigantic steps. You don't, you don't have to lecture them about the size of the steps. A circle is a magic teaching tool. And I go in and I, I see a group that's having trouble. I just do a lot of circle lefts and promenades. I want them to average out their pace because that's what a dance team does, a partnership in ballroom dancing. They got to learn to match their stride. Square dancing to me is a dance and I want them to flow to that music, okay? Uh, a little call that I use, a good friend of mine, you all know Ken Bauer, right? He calls me up in late October. He's doing a a thing for an elementary school. And he said, Bob, I need material. I say, gosh, it's, it's Halloween. You got to go out and do a Bigfoot stomp. And, and Ken says, I can't do that. It's got a grand square in it. I said, call grand circle. He said, what? 
do this, and I bet you you'll learn it. Your any dancer will learn it just that. I say circle left sixteen steps when you're home. Circle right sixteen steps, and you'll be home. And you can sing your heart out. This is so good for one night stands for kids. I do a lot of kids. They love to hear you sing the song. You know, and an adult, you're just a big kid, aren't you? Absolutely. And they love singing. They even love my singing, which is seldom on pitch. Okay? And that's so important. So I do that. And for kids, I, because I'm also oriented to working with third and fourth graders, how long does it take to circle left 16 steps? What if you're facing out? And I say circle left. How long does it take to go around the circle? Longer. What? I said longer. You said longer. Yeah. How, 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 what's the distance? Is the distance any different? No. Nope. It's exactly the same. And they can learn to do it in 16 okay. steps. Okay. Whatever direction you're going, you don't circle sideways. If you're circling left, you angle slightly to the left and walk forward around the circle. Yeah. And with the kids and adults, I said, make sure your circle retains a round shape because a circle is a round thing. And that effort of keeping it round smooths out their stepping, okay? If you got one lazy person that steps in toward the middle, it just, it really messes everything up. And I showed them that. Uh, oh, that really messes things up if one person steps into the middle and is not doing the full circle thing. Now, what is really fun, you know, we're, we're on a pro- rush to get the plus, but you know what the kids like? Join hands, circle left around. Now, all the boys turn around. The boys go right, the girls go left, circle around. And they just laugh their heads off. It's fun, but they can do it in 16 beats. When they master that little thing of being to do all these variations of circle left, head couples, you turn back. Join hands, circle. Heads go right, sides go left. You have to do that, okay? And you would say this, heads go right, sides go left, circle. You put that first, okay, so they know which way to go. And it works just the same. They can do that then all these complications that develop in other calls later on, it don't happen. Okay. A next major point I wanted to get into is old-time square dancing. I am just the hugest fan of goalposting. By goalposting, if you're not aware of it, heads pass through, separate around one, into the middle pass through, split two, separate around one, you know, do the whole thing. And I talked to Bob Osgood once, and I says, You know, there's a lot of calls in that sequence. You know, you can take and analyze certain parts, and you can say split two is a centers in, step and slide. Separate around one is a clover leaf. It's all there, and they're learning patterns. It doesn't have to be clover leaf yet, but they're walking in a path that later on, when you want to teach clover leaf, it's a familiar path. So you're pre-teaching. Uh, Betsy talked about the square through one, two. I don't separate it by days, but I saw Jerry Helt, a good friend, do it at a, at a folk dance thing, and he does. Head square through one, do a U-turn back. Head square through one, you're back home. Do it for the sides. Then he do head square through two, do a U-turn back and square through two, do a U, and then the sides. And he did the whole thing, and I loved it, and I fell in love, and I used that. But this year, I love my gold posting, right? I use this routine, and I find it very successful. See, the gold posting, too, puts people in motion, right? And it's got two things that are so important. I had used the word counter dancing in that, but it was a totally different meaning than yours. It was, I was taught by Bill Kastner, you never stand still. If you're not being called to, you're tapping your feet. If somebody walks behind you, you walk forward. If somebody comes in between you, you go sideways. If somebody goes to the middle, you back up and come together. Actually, in that goalposting thing, everybody takes the same amount of steps, even though half the square receives no instructions. 
And I tell the people, that's important. Half of you are not going to talk to, so I'm going to explain what you have to do first. And then only talk to the others. That, I like to think of it as the etiquette of dancing. You're making it easy for other people to achieve their goals. That is so important to be considerate of other dancers. And you use the demonstration, okay? Heads pass through. Promenade home, sides stand there. God, it takes forever. Heads pass through. Sides step into the middle and the heads promenade home. You just save four steps. Isn't that nice to help somebody save four steps? Yeah. And then everything fits better. Uh, I forget it was something you said about the pass-through and it's uncomfortable facing out. Yeah, they worry about it. <laughs> yeah. So... The first thing I do is, well, I showed you I did the pastors, but heads pass through and promenade home on the outside. See, now they're not worried about that they were facing out. And to give that dynamics and the overall feeling of a fancy dance, heads pass through, promenade home while the sides circled four in the middle one time. It got them to the middle, and the sides are going one direction, and the heads are going the other direction. Energy. That's the, you ever do that, look out the front of the car, you're barely moving, look out the side, you're flying. If those people are going the opposite direction, you get the illusion of going at twice the speed without any effort. So I like that. And it makes, I've done it at, at the county fair, and people looking at, those are not beginners. That looks like an exhibition group. It's the choreography that makes it look like an exhibition group. It doesn't have to be difficult. Okay. And that's what is square breathing on there. Okay. Talked about tapping toes. Oh, one other thing that I'll do that's totally different from what you do is sometimes I group calls. And what I want to tell you is, in my opinion... A call is not a dance. A group of calls creates a dance. So when I teach heads lead right, I teach heads lead right, veer left. That's so easy to add on. Couple circulate, that's so easy to do. Bend the line, and they're normal. So I do those four calls together. Am I worried about they'll always do that call in that order? No, because they're learning the flow. And they're hearing each part as they do it. Well, gee whiz, I did four calls in the times it takes to teach one. Um, a little thought about veer left. If you have trouble on it, couples, okay, head square through four. I'm just making, you don't, you just get there, whatever. Do a dosado, right? Couples dosado. Couples just do the first part. That's a veer left. Do the second part. That's a veer right. And then if you really want to get, you can do a reverse veer left and a reverse veer right or reverse right and left. And that's, and I use that thing. Like I said, I'm crazy. Okay. Oh, now I start preparing dancers to learn calls sometimes a month or so before I call the call. What am I teaching here? I got heads half sashay. Heads pass through, both turn right, single file, go back home. Okay? Heads pass through, turn right, single file, promenade a quarter. Face the signs. You know, you're behind them. Not hard, right? Then I build it, and it builds the heads pass through, turn right, inside single file, promenade home, or inside promenade a quarter. You got that? Then later on, as the class has progressed, Heads past the ocean. The girls step behind the boys, single file, promenade a quarter. It's something they already know. Okay? Or the heads promenade inside a quarter. Okay, the first one, heads or past the ocean, ladies fold, single file, promenade a quarter and face in, is part of the original recycle call. That's what the sinners did in all eight recycle. Okay? And so why not use his original intent as a way to teach dancers to do it? And they, they've got it that quick, that quick. I mean, I, I cannot, it's almost effortless. 
Then it's heads past the ocean. Girls fold inside single file promenade a quarter. And then I say, That's, that is so good, they gave it a name. They called it Recycle. And they could do it. Then it's work with the outside couple. On your outside the square, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to promenade around your group of four. And they've got Recycles. Uh, I, I jumped ahead of myself there. One major thing. Okay, a couple of things. First, you turn back. How many of you ever taught you turn back and they turn the wrong way? Nobody? Oh, you have. Well, thank you. Uh, I had that problem for 35 years, maybe. Uh, it's uh, roughly at least 30. And then one night I discovered heads pass through. Hold hands. Change the hand. Turn around. That's a U turn back. You teach them to use the hands to dance. We don't put enough emphasis on the hands. If you change the hands first, who do you think will turn the wrong way? Nobody is the absolute, and that's our goal, right? To get everybody to do it right. So I do it first. I don't just let them turn around. Heads pass through, change hands, and a U turn back, and they got it nailed. Now here, this one's going to surprise you. Walk and dodge. I'm doing walk and dodges in the third and fourth night of class, deliberately. But I get, whenever, as soon as I get a facing line, I do facing walk and dodges. Boy, walk, girl, dodge. I'm out of time? No. Oh. Okay, boy, walk, girl, dodge. Now, from my earlier demonstration, they're not facing the same way. What do they do? They make a right-hand star. What do the two people side by side in the middle do? They make a left-hand star. You might think that's an ocean wave. Not yet. It's, it's the stars. And then I say, boys walk, girls dodge. The right-hand star turn half. The left-hand star turn half. No, it's not a swing through. It's a right-hand star and a left-hand star. But it's a pattern that I can call without teaching. I could do this at a one-night stand and be doing the equivalence of swing-throughs. Okay? And then later on, now later on, I always used to have a problem when I said walk and dodge, the lady would turn around and face back in. You've seen that, right? Oh, it's a nightmare. I don't have that problem anymore because when they first learned to dodge, they were facing in. So they were constantly moving sideways. And this dodge call is so important. Uh, what I used to first teach, run. There's a runner and a runee, right? Now, yeah, I just made up that term. You know, one person goes around, the other one moves sideways. Then I figured it out. One person goes around, the other dodges. A run incorporates a dodge. It's less material for them to assimilate. Okay. We talked about square throughs. Wheel and deal. Uh, bless the challenge people. <laughs> when I learned wheel and deal, is the couple on the left-hand side step forward. The other stay. Now, I call pastor and I teach trades. Then I have couples trading until they're smooth at it. Okay, that's the key, not to rush. No hurry. When they're really good at doing couples trade, I say, couples, we're only going to trade halfway. Okay? When the girls are side by side, you're going to finish turning in as though you did the whole trade. And that's a wheel and deal. And they get it right the first time, and they number, never fumble, never get the wrong couple in the middle. I just love it. Okay, uh, that's a longer one. Uh, just a quick mention on the call slide through. How many of you heard the terminology slide through? You do a star through without hands? Yeah, never, ever say that. Slide through, don't make the arch. Because you don't want them to carry it on to the end of the call and not join the hands. Without the arch, star through is a slide through. It's just semantics, but it doesn't give clutter to their brain, okay? Then I'm uh, talking about flutter wheel. I had read once that flutter wheel was 
the lady's most unpopular call in all of square dancing because it's done wrong and the boys don't get out in front. So when I'm going to, I pre-teach flutter wheel by having from facing couples, ladies go in with the right arm turned, come back and stand beside the man. That's her part of flutter wheel, right? And they do it fine. Then I say couples circle halfway. Then I say, without hands, couples circle halfway. Without hands, couples circle halfway. While the boy does his part of the circle halfway, I want the girls to do an arm turn and come back to where you were. And that's a flutter wheel. And they do it gracefully and on time. Okay. Uh, Oh, here's one that I like. Sorry, Elmer, I'm going to use your name. (laughs) <laughs> Elmer was do- taping some stuff and I was working on teaching him how to help teach better and do choreography and he called spin the top and I heard him call spin the top and this is less a couple of months ago this soon okay and I thought that's the way I teach it damn that was a 30 minute tip it's got to be better than that there's got to be a better way this is new Okay, I tried it on my beginner class. Let me say it was awesome. Okay, you got to wave, right? Swing through. Let's say girls are on the end. Girls trade, boys trade. Swing through, boys trade, girls trade. You know, you're trading them both, right? Till they're comfortable with those two trades, okay? Now, uh, let's swing through. I want the boys and the girls to trade with each other. Everybody trade. They can do that. Okay, when they're comfortable, the secret is let them become comfortable. Then you say, this time I want you to only do half the trade. Swing through, do a half a trade. Does anybody know what that call is? Spin the top. So I took a 30-minute tip and I made it into a 7 or 8-minute tip. Uh, I I don't do it everything at once. But the actual, the actual teach where we stop and walk through is when we only do half a trade, we call it spin the top. And what we're doing is when the centers trade and do a half a trade, that's a three-quarter turn, which is a nightmare to a lot of people. They can't do a three-quarter turn. But if you do a half a turn, if you turn halfway and a quarter more, they can do that. That's okay. But three quarters, I had an engineer in my class. He said, I got to turn a quarter then trade, you know, or whatever. But by doing that, and then I break in and say, well, the first part is called a spin. That's the swing through when the center's half trade. Now, when the outsides do their half trade, they're topping it off. You know, they're finishing the call, right? And that's where we got the name spin the top. What have I done? I've got a a visual reference to what the call is telling them to do. Um, Bob, two-minute warning. What? Oh, two-minute warning. warning. Okay. The last one, Elmer called me up. He says, I'm doing Dixie style. What am I going to do there? Oh, piece of cake, because I've been doing this one for years. My dancers learn Dixie style very quickly and very smoothly. Okay, I set, up, I set up a situation. Heads pass through, separate around one, make a line. Pass through, wheel and deal. We have four ladies in the middle. Girls square through three and do a left touch a quarter. I call that until they're good at it, okay? And then I do the same thing. I say girls square through one, do a left touch a quarter. What's that called? Dixie style. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It is a Dixie style, but how to get them to do it from couples? Well, you got to teach the boy his part first because he's reluctant. If you, you could mess this up. Everybody do a half sachet. Girls give a right hand pull by and left touch a quarter. Now he's in the right place to do it. And that's what makes it uncomfortable. When the boy stays where he is and the girl pulls by, they're offset. So when you actually do a Dixie style, as the girl pulls by, the boy sashays over so his left hand is in a feel-good place. 
and then you do your left touch a quarter. And you will be amazed at how quickly and how good they do Dixie style. Okay. I'm sorry to rush through anything, but maybe is, is there a question on the floor about anything? Okay, no. If anybody ever wants to have a question about anything, you can look me up on the web and I'll be glad. I'll call you or email you, whatever, because Bob loves to teach. He's crazy about it. Thank you. Thank you. Just real quickly, uh, you notice Bob mentioned a number of times about taking hands, and I think uh, if you do much research, you'll find in the guidelines and in, in various publications, this is hammered home again and again and again. And it not only helps with the positions and the teaching he's talking about, it's also helpful for the next call the dancers have to do. And it also keeps the square smaller, that it doesn't get too large, that it's, that it's hard to do um, the calls. Uh, the other thing, uh, the value of the walkthrough, of course, has been a valuable teaching tool for years. But don't forget you can use that also on a dance floor when you need to get more people involved and need to do it quickly. There's nothing wrong with doing a good walkthrough. Excuse me about this. Somewhere I wanted to say it. But one thing that has worked well for me in the last few years is less walkthroughs. Okay, I I pointed out how I pre-teach by taking them through sequences to minimize the walkthrough. Now, the plus dancers, they enjoy dancing with the new people because they don't have to do those walkthroughs that they're sick and tired of. Let them dance. Let them learn by dancing to the beat of the music. And finally, it's the caller who has to make it enjoyable. I think you want to take that away from... Uh, from here today. So it's really your job uh, to go out there and make it enjoyable for the dancers. I want to thank Betsy and Bob. Thank you. For thank you. And, thank all of them. and thank all of you for. Yeah, without you guys, we would have been nothing. <laughs>